Dear God, I thank you that we can all be here together today and ready to worship your name. It's truly something amazing that so many people have made the choice to dedicate their time to you this morning. And I pray that all our praises to you can rise up and reach you. I pray that as we gather here, our hearts can be calmed and focus on you, Lord. We spend so much time being focused on other things and chasing other things. Just let this be a time where we turn our eyes back to you. Let us see in your word and your praises that everything and all that matters in our lives is just you. We lay down every burden to you this morning, and I pray that you'll continue to bring us the peace that only you can bring. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Good morning, everyone. Let's all rise and sing praises to our God together.
2024 is like we passed almost one month. Um, I don't know about your plan or resolution or your reading Bible plan. We have um, we did a um, altar call two weeks ago, and there be um, you have been like replying, responding to God. I don't know how like how it's going in your life now. Um, I would have saying something like, um, there will be always a second chance. Uh, even you forget about, oh, really, I, did, I, did I raise my hands? Uh, I, and I totally forgot about God. But there's always a chance because um, in the Bible, it says, whoever is in Christ, we are new creation. The old has passed and the new has come. Um, I believe 2024, our church, or English surface, I don't know. Uh, we have something new. We, we, we will have, like, we wife will have something, like, to do differently. And start from us, actually. Start really from us. And we have to change. And we have to discipline ourselves. We have to try our very best to learn how to love God. To read more Bible. To pray more. And to continue to worship Him. So I would like to uh, pray for us. And let this new thing uh, God started, and we will continue, and He will complete for sure for us. Let's join, join me with prayer. Father God, we come to you. We know that this is a new year. 2024, there will be so many things will be changed in this world. New precedent in Taiwan, new precedent in U.S. 
things will be changing in this world, but also, I, I guess, the most important part is how about our hearts? Are we changing towards you, Lord? We know that one thing will never change is your love. You will not, you will, you will not love us less. No matter what, you love us so much. And because of this love, we want to respond to you. Lord, help us. Uh, help us to discipline ourselves, to do some more spiritual discipline, uh, uh, like, like more prayer, more like Bible study, and not just uh, because we want, we, 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 we forced to do it, but really because inside us, we want to respond to your love to us. So we pray to you, we worship you, and we read the Bible and to equip ourselves to be more mature in in you, Lord. Help us, Lord, as a community of faith. Let us to be like doing this together and let something new will happen in our spiritual life in this 2024. Be with everyone and bless us. And in Jesus' name, we pray. Amen.
Today's scripture reading is taken from 1 John chapter 1, verses 8 to 10. If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just, and will forgive our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. If we claim we have not sinned, we make him out to be a liar, and his word has no place in our lives. This is the word of God. Good morning, everyone, and a belated happy Christmas, happy new year, and soon to be lunar new year, right? <laughs> well, it's good to see you as always, and uh, before I start, Sometimes I have slides, sometimes I don't. So let me start. So we, we, I think we all kind of, we all bought stuff at Amazon. At some point, some, some of us may buy more, more than others. So I'm gonna show you some slides of Amazon items that I saw, not, not necessarily bought, but you can guess what it is. Does anyone have any guess what this, what this is? <laughs> this is, is a, is a big bun that you can snuggle up to on your bed, so much like your, your, your plush toys. Actually, it's scented too, so it smells like a bun too. How about that? What does that look like? It's hard to see, but it's similar to the, to the plush toy bun. This is actually a big, a big taco shell that you snuggle in, 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 into. It's an oversized taco shell, not, not a real taco shell but an oversized taco shell that you can snuggle up when you're watching TV. Ah, my favorite one. This is, <laughs> what do you think this is? This is a calendar of pooping, pooping pooches. Wouldn't you love to have that? <laughs> and what, what would you, what would go well with the pooping pooches calendar, but the toilet timer. Anyways. Anyways, we start off our morning. Um, one of the reasons I think we, we buy items, you know, weird, weird or, or, or expensive, is because it helps us feel happy. It helps us feel happy in some way. But I think the word happy is such a, it's interesting, it's a finicky word because it, it gets one-sided. That word happiness gets one-sided. Today's passage, the, the Apostle John he wants us to experience something that is more radically different, that's more, more lasting and life-giving than happy. And this is joy. He mentions it. It's joy. But how do we get this? When we, when we live in a world where, where our joy, my joy is, is limited to, to how long my, my cell phone battery is, is going to last, how many people will like my posts, uh, what are... What are uh, whether someone replies to my text messages or my WhatsApp messages, or whether I can binge watch my favorite t television show, whether or not I have enough gaming time, or what's happening around the world, around, around, around me. In other words, why does joy, why does my joy seem like so hard to find, and yet I see it in others, or I kind of see it in, in others. John gives us a little direction, and it's when he brings up the topic of sin and darkness, which is our title of our sermon, Overcoming Sin and Darkness. Though it can hold us back, it's, it's what, what we hold on to that makes a difference. Though it can hold us back, it's what we hold on to, what we hold on to in it that makes a difference. But the sad thing is that we, um, we know this, but we don't know it. And what I mean is that the challenge with this passage is that, that we are so used, used to it that we almost accept it. And so it's kind of like this. It's kind of like if you ask a fish, if you ask a fish, if you ask a fish, what's, what's water? 
it will probably not know or have an, an answer because it's never re really been out, out of water unless it's dead, maybe. So like the fish, we can take sin and darkness for granted. Almost like we, we're, we're, we know about it, but we don't really know that it's happening ar around me. But John doesn't take this uh, sin and darkness for, for, for granted. Um, but just like the problem is so basic, you know, we, we, we take it for granted, the solution is, is straightforward that we can miss the, the importance of, of, of it if we don't put some thought into it. So the title of today's sermon can be an example of how we, how we take this topic for granted with how we respond to it. So for, for us to, to experience this, this joy and escape sin and darkness, this passage this morning will sh sh hopefully show us three things. I'm going to share with you three things of it. One, we need to start with God. Two, we need to see that we are, we are sinners in need of a Savior. And three, we need Jesus to set us free from, from sin and darkness. At the end, if time permits, I will give, us, so I take some, uh, give you some practical points to take home with. So the first one, as you can see on the slide, we need to start with, with God. New Year 2024, we all have goals. Whether it was 2024 or 2023 or 2022, we all have goals. And to reach a goal, we all need to start somewhere, right? We need, like for example, we need ingredients for making a cake. We need uh, training for those of you who, who, are, who run, who want to uh, go into a, do a marathon or a half marathon or 5K or, or, or 10K. John's goal is for everyone to experience this fullness of, of joy. But how? How do we ask? So he starts off by saying, um, we, though we read from verse 8 to 10, back it up a bit. He starts off by saying in verse 5, this is the message from Jesus. And now I declare to you, God is light. Now upon reading this, this is confusing because some of us may be thinking, I don't, I don't feel the joy from, from this. I don't get it. And John probably wouldn't disagree with you, but he has an understanding that has hit him personally because when you go even further back, a bit further back, in verse 1, it says, he has seen and touched Jesus. He's had a personal experience with, the, with, the, with, the, with Jesus. He's saying that if you don't get a good understanding, not just the factual stuff, not just information, if you don't get a good, deep, personal understanding of this, that God is light, that is, that God is perfect, that he's holy, that he's, he's morally pure, that he's absolutely just, and God cannot tolerate evil, then you won't get what this joy means. So to get what this joy is, we need to start with, with God. Now, many of us here, we know people, we know people, maybe it's us as well, who think this concept that, that God is holy is for old, old farts like, like me. Um, and maybe some of you are thinking that way this morning. So many of us, we throw this concept just out the, out the window, that, that God is holy, and we feel it's useless. It's, it's, it's like it's out of touch. You know, some of us may be saying that uh, you believe more in a God of love. But God is saying if you don't attempt to understand what, what a holy and just God is, you'll never personally and deeply know the love of God and experience this joy that Scripture mentions. So think about it this way. The earth and all the other planets, they have, they have a center that they all revolve around, right? The, the sun. I know there's people who think otherwise, but we'll, we'll stick on the, con on, the, on the theory that the sun is the center of it. If one of those planets, planets they switch their orbital cycles and began doing their own thing, scientifically, it would, it would be dis disast disastrous. Um, in the same principle, God in all he does and wants us to be, he wants us to be centered on what he shows, what he teaches, is good, is right, is pure, is holy, and is just. Now, this is all fine with, with us, but when it boils down to it, we end up not choosing what God teaches us, what's pure, what's right, what's, what's just. We actually 
choose what is comfortable with myself, with our, ourselves. Whether we admit that or not, we, 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 we do that. So when people make statements like, like, I don't believe in a God of justice, I believe in a God of love, we will, we will have a great difficulty dealing with, with things like suffering in this world because when it boils down to it again, we are choosing us, our comforts, our expectations, instead of starting with God and a right understanding of him and his, his purposes and his ways. The reason the gospel message starts with God is because all our problems, uh, hopefully you're, you're all sitting, all our problems are self-centered at the core. Sorry if that's a message you don't want to hear, but that's, that's, that's the understanding. All our problems are, are self-centered at the core. When all, all of us came to know God or were searching, searching Christianity, searching uh, the Christian faith in some way, it was generally about a problem in, in your life. So when, when it came to our problems, our approach to God is this. What can you offer me? What can you do for me, God? Or what do I need to give up? But the gospel message is, is here's how you get out of sin and darkness. Stop thinking about what you are owed and start thinking about God and who he is and what he is owed. When we don't start with God, we, and just think of ourselves, we, we never understand ourselves or life as, as God presents it to us. And we remain in confusion, which is darkness. Because God's love is not based on us. Here's the, tr here's the beautiful truth of it. God's love is not based on us, what we do or achieve but on his character. The character I mentioned earlier, some of that, he's pure, he's holy, he's just. It's not based on us, on what we do. It's straightforward. It's based on who he is. We need to understand that God knows us better than we know ourselves. He knows the world better than we do, too. Starting with God is not meant to be a one-time deal, but it's a continual process of turning to God as he transforms us to be more like his character. Just like how we remember in the, in the, in the creation story, God created men and women to be as, in his image. And God constantly wants us to be, be living under his, his image. But just as it's important to serve God, we need to see that we are sinful, that we are sinful, we need a Savior, that we are sinners needing a Savior. Verse 8, I'll read it again. If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. The late pastor Tim Keller, he once he once shared about this a man who he this man led a pretty immoral life who and at his death he was asked aren't you afraid to face God this man answered it's okay because God will forgive me anyways some of us probably have similar thoughts when we don't take time to have an understanding of a holy and just God we will have trouble seeing we are sinners or that we've sinned, or even take, take responsibility in some way that we've sinned. In a sense, we take it for granted. We take it for granted. During this time of, of uh, uh, this, the, book, the book of uh, 1 John, there were false teachers. These false teachers were, were called Gnostics. The Gnostics taught that sin wasn't real. It was an illusion, like darkness. And they claimed that that they had some special knowledge, some special magic and power over, over others that made or helped them know God better. And they believed that this was the key to their salvation, to their, their eternal life. This just meant that, that there were many Christians uh, back then who were being confused and disillusioned by, by these, these false teachers because it fed into what made them feel comfortable about God. But before we go further, let's, let's just talk about darkness. 
particularly about how the Bible just describes it. Because again, I, I think we know the word, the word, but we don't, we don't since we take it for, for granted. So for example, the Bible will talk about darkness of the mind, it'll talk of, uh, which means confusion. Then it, it will mention darkness of the soul, um, which, which, which means despair. But when it talks about darkness of the heart, it's usually referring to the evil, to wickedness, to impurity, lust, and violence. So, some, some, some examples like that. When we think about it carefully, we do think about darkness. When we ask the, the question, why do we do things? Why do we do things we know are, are wrong? Or why do we kind of why do we strive or aspire for things we can never we can never get to? Why do why do people why do we mistreat one, one another? This is all in that realm of cat or category. It's dark darkness. What are you what are you know it or or not? But like the Christians then, we get confused and have a hard time with concepts like, like, like sin. We even question, if there is this thing called sin, how, how can I be born of it? Well, verse 8 says, if we claim we don't have sin, we are fooling ourselves and not living in the truth. Some of us may be saying, but I am living in the, in the truth. I think the question you should be consider asking more is what is your truth based on before you even say I'm living in truth. What is your truth based on? What moral truth or abs what absolute truth is your truth ba based on? Because the reality is that when we get disappointments in life, we turn to the truth that is the most comfortable for us. Not, and comfortable doesn't mean it's the, mo it's the most truth. It's the most truthful. When we do this, this is in essence what the Bible describes as, as sin. Normally, we, just, we define sin as doing bad things. But according to the Bible, sin, according to the Bible, is doing anything, even good things, that becomes more important than God. Sin is doing anything, even good things, that become more important than God. Let that sink in to you this morning. If you don't remember anything from today's message, let that sink into you. Whether you see it or not, we tend to focus on ourselves, thinking we know what is the best for us, <laughs> sometimes for others. We think we know the best for, for others. A man was, was praying with his was pastor at, at the altar, and he, he prayed a prayer uh, that the pastor heard many times before. And this is the prayer. Lord, take the cobwebs out of my life. And just as he was saying this, the pastor interrupts him. And he says this, kill that spider, Lord. Many times we ask God to forgive us of some, some sin, yet we leave the source of the temptation in our life. How many of us approach Christianity in the same way? Like, we want the gift of eternal life, but we don't see anything wrong with things like complaining. We like the idea of forgiveness, but we refuse to show forgiveness, but can only think of revenge. How can I get back at that person for doing that to me? Or you like the idea of justice, but think other people are worse than you. How can they do that when I'm, when I'm, I'm like this? To escape darkness, we need to not only confess all our sins, but we need to admit that we are sinners ourselves that make things, um, that we that admit we are sinners. We didn't need to admit that our lives become more out of control when we refuse to admit that we are sinners needing Jesus to free us from sin and darkness, which leads to our, our final point. Verse 9 and 10 says, again, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just, and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. If we claim we have not sinned, we make him out to be a liar, and his word is not in us. When a baby cries, it's trying to send a message to its, its parents. But when something bad happens more than once, sometimes the baby can become silent, not, 
or making a word, or it can have uncontrollable tantrums. And I think we respond similarly because like the child, we are, we're just trying to gain control in order to survive whatever happening in, in, in our world. In psychology, this is called flight or, or fight. And no doubt, these, this whole past couple years of the pandemic, we, it's been hard on every one of us. It's uh, either causes us to draw closer or run further from, from God. John knew that we would never find in, in ourselves uh, the faithfulness that God requires. We cannot escape sin and darkness based upon our own strength and, and wisdom. It's impossible. According to Scripture, it's impossible. Instead, John is challenging us to place complete trust in the work and the grace and the power of God. God, again, who is alone, who is holy and just, cannot coexist with, with sin. So God sets out a plan to conquer, conquer, conquer sin and its, and its heavy burden that it places on every, every person in this world. So he chose to kill his only son, Jesus, in order to bear the full weight of sin so that we wouldn't have to suffer God's wrath but, but live flourishing lives as he originally planned. From the beginning of the chapter, John points out to us this, he says, this message we have heard and seen. This message we have heard and seen. You notice he doesn't start off by saying, well, you know I'm old. I've been around for a long time. I studied, I studied plenty of religion, theology, and philosophy. So I thought about many things. No, he doesn't start like that. He essentially is starting off and he says, all the education I, I know means nothing, nothing compared to experiencing the power of the resurrected Jesus Christ. That's what he's basically saying. But somehow, we have been blinded because, because some of us are afraid to make mistakes. Right? Some of us, maybe all of us, are afraid to make mistakes. Even to God. Even to God to admit it. And believe in the same, and to believe in the same lie that the serpent gave to the first humans. Adam, Adam and Eve. That God doesn't care. And that's, why, that's one reason why it's, we're afraid to make mistakes. We do this in two ways. We either isolate from everyone, maybe from some people, or, or we do more good stuff to cover up those mistakes so that no one can see my, my mistakes. But the truth of the gospel is that you and I are already accepted and forgiven because of what Jesus did on the cross for you. Again, it's not because of what we do did or we do. It's because of God's character that we are accepted and for forgiven. And a big part of this points back to the first point because, again, we don't understand the holiness of God and how his love is expressed by, by needing to rid this world of sin. Somehow we need to get a deeper understanding and a deeper grasp, a deeper perhaps acceptance of that. Or we just need to see the need for I think that's what it boils down to. We kind of only want to see our need for our version of Jesus. We only want our version of Jesus. So when John talks about confessing our sins, he's not teaching us to get, to, to get God to forgive us and to re-justify us because this has been done once and for all through Jesus. Jesus justified us, justified us for our sins once and for all. Basically, through in the scripture, he's teaching us this. We ask God to forgive us not to be re-justified, but to walk before him in confidence that Christ has paid it all. It's not, we don't come to God to confessing our sins to re-justify us. It's been done. We do it as a reminder that God is walking with us and we can walk confidently in this. Hebrews 4, 16 says, let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our times of need. So the lie of the enemy is this. I obey, or related to that, I, I serve, therefore I'm accepted by God. That's the lie from Satan, from the enemy. God's truth, the gospel truth is this. 
I am accepted by God through what Christ has done. Therefore, I obey. Therefore, I, I serve. But we live in a world where confessing our mistakes, confessing our failures, admitting it, showing our limitations is, is, is weakness. Therefore, I don't do it. But the gospel message flips everything around by asking us to admit that we are weak, but trust that God's grace is sufficient. President Abraham Lincoln, he signed the Emancipation Proclamation on September 22nd, 1862. The moment that went into effect on January 1st, 1863, every slave living in the Confederacy was legally free. But until they knew of their freedom, the legal fact had no impact on their lives because they didn't know. In fact, Union soldiers carried hundreds of thousands of copies of the proclamation and passed them out as they made their way through the South during the war. In the same way, Christ has set us free from the power of sin, but we must recognize that fact. We must recognize that fact and live like it. Somehow, we've been confused and blinded. We don't recognize it. We forget that. It's been done. In other words, because of what Christ did on the cross for us, the doors to the jail cell are wide open. The key has, is thrown away. We are free. So why do we keep going back into the jail cell? Why do we keep looking at our, at our mistakes when God only sees what Christ has done on the cross? Why do we keep doing good things to make ourselves feel worthy when God, through Jesus, already sees us as wonderfully made? Why do we, even on the flip side of that, why do we see others as, as, as irresponsible, as mistakes, when God sees them as, as good? Our salvation is not something we accomplished. Jesus accomplished it. For us on the cross. It is ours through faith in him to live in sync with his reality that we don't need to seek comforts in the things of this world in all our Amazon packages or anything of that like which can't last, right? Life can be enjoyed but only as an appetizer of the, of the coming feast where we will be fully free from all sin and, and darkness. Before I close, let me uh, leave you with some practical points on that. The first one is don't underestimate prayer. Don't ask, underestimate prayer, praying to God. So ask God to provide someone or someone to, to pray with you, to pray with you through, through your, especially maybe your, the questions of faith, questions of spirituality, questions about Jesus, about, about God, before you begin walking away uh, uh, because, of, because of your mistakes, because of things you've done or are not done. Don't do, it, don't do it alone. Don't do this alone. God made us all relational. God gives you people in your life. Don't do it alone. Don't fight this alone. Don't, underest uh, don't underestimate prayer. If you don't pray, don't underestimate prayer from someone else because there's a person, there's a power behind that prayer that loves you loves you deeply and dearly. Second one is be bold. Question your own questions. Don't assume that you are always right. So whatever you're questioning, question those questions. And even ask questions to, to seek more understanding about your questions, to seek more clarity. Be, be bold about it. Ask, ask Pastor Felix. Ask anyone else. Ask anyone in your, in your leaders. Ask me if you want. In both senses, in both practical points, be bold. Ask someone to pray for you, pray with you, and be bold. Ask questions. Don't, don't do this, this faith walk or, or journey with Jesus alone. Seek someone else. So as you go out today, I pray that... Um, let, me, let me close in a word of prayer on that note. God, may you be of each person as sin is still affecting each one of our lives, sin and darkness. Help us to know and believe that through Jesus, we are not alone. 
I pray, God, that on, in that context, that you would send a person or persons to every person here that would pray for them, to walk this journey, walk their Emmaus road with them so that they can know you more deeply and, more you, and know you more intimately. And may they, through that, may they experience your love and your grace and your mercy and, your, and the fullness of joy. Thank you, Jesus, for this congregation. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Before uh, we sing the responsive song, I want you guys to uh, prepare your hearts as we have our communion today together as well. Um, in the song that we will about to sing, it said, Where sin run deep, your grace is more. Where grace is found is where you are. And where you are, Lord, I am free. Holiness is Christ in me. Think about this. When you are about to sing, or you can, I encourage you to have a prayerful heart, to, um, to pray to God during the song. You don't need to sing it out. You can sing in your heart. You can sing it out whatever you want. It's okay. But think about like the message that is like tied up to what it's going to, to do in our life. Because I, I really like how one pastor saying, we are unpunished. We are unpunished. Because Christ did everything for us. Our sin already forgiven. Yes, confession of sin is a reminder, as uh, uh, Robert is saying to us. He wants to remind us that we already en 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 engage with that grace of God. And we have to go into that grace again and again. And then we will be free. So I want you guys to stand with me and to meditate on the song, sing to the song to prepare your heart. Jesus. 
start everything from you, not from ourselves. Forgive our sin, Lord. Forgive that we are always thinking about ourselves first. And Lord, forgive all our sin, even though something we think is good, but we think it is actually putting those things higher than you, and that become idolatry. That become a sin. Forgive us, Lord. Be with everyone. And set us free, Lord. We are not just about like, so sad, so sad, because we are confessing our sin, we are not doing good. But it is about joy, because you already give us grace. You did everything for us on the cross, and we are free because of you. Let us to enjoy this freedom. Let us to be rejoiced in our hearts. As we are celebrating the communion together, Lord, be with everyone and bless us and let us to taste your goodness once again. And in Jesus' name, we pray. Amen. Yeah, you may be seated. It's time for communion. Holy are you and blessed is your Son, Jesus Christ, whom you sent in the fullness of time to redeem the world, he emptied himself, taking the form of a servant, being born in our likeness. He humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even death on a cross. He took upon himself our sin and death and offered himself a perfect sacrifice for the sin of the whole world. By the baptism of his suffering, death, In resurrection, you gave birth to your church. Deliver us from slavery to sin and death. And make with us a new confidence by the water and the spirit. On the day, on the night in in which he gave himself up for us, he took the bread. Gave thanks to you, broke the bread gave it to his disciple and said, Take it, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. When the supper is over, he took the cup, gave hands to you, gave it to his disciple and said, Drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant. Pour out for you, and for many for the forgiveness of sin. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Let's proclaim the mystery of faith together. Christ has died, Christ is risen, Christ will come again, and He will come. So now, I, let me to in, invite the musician and the server to come.
presence of Christ. This is the blood Christ. Communion in our church tradition, it will be open for those who confirm and baptize. And if you're ready, you can come. You can take home or you can partake in here. So if you're ready, you can come from this side of the aisle.
So let's stand and recite the Lord's Prayer together. Let's pray together. Uh, Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. Let's continue to uh, pray. Uh, let's pray and receive the benediction by faith. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen. And now will usually be the time for offering, so you can give your offering in the offering box at the entrance of the sanctuary. You can interact e-transfer to inquiry at tcmc.ca, or you can deliver or send the check to the church office. Just make sure you call prior to your delivery. So the first announcement for today is for United. And so the United Fellowship for grades 7 and 8 will have their monthly meeting today after service. Um, the next announcement is treating our church as home. So as TCMC is home, it's important that we treat this place with care. So just a reminder to turn off the tap after using it in the washroom and turn off the lights before you leave any room. The last announcement for today is about baptism. So for those who are considering to receive children baptism, adult baptism, confirmation, or want to join TCMC as members on Easter Sunday, so that's March 31st, please contact our pastors to arrange for preparation classes. So here are the responsibilities for next week, and after a moment of silence, service will be concluded. <laughs> 